if you think to yourself, I wish it was easier, I wish I had more support, I wish I could be more of myself at work, then welcome to the club. The reality is fintech is not that sexy. It is hard work, but it is super fun and fulfilling. Why? Because most of us are in a vulnerable financial position and suffer from money stress. So our job as fintechers is to come up with solutions. Welcome to Fintech Product, the place to be for career advice for women in fintech. I am Moni Millares, and I've built a career building digital banks from scratch, both in the UK and Southeast Asia. I strongly believe in togetherness, and I'm here to open up, share, and bring fintech product and leadership experts together so that you don't have to start from scratch to thrive in your career in fintech. I'm Mexican British living in Asia and I'm recognized as Singapore 65 fintech product leaders and women in fintech. Hello everyone and welcome back to one of the most wanted, desired and asked for topics for this episode. So Before I tell you what's the episode, I'll tell you who we have today. So today we have Dr. Veronica Asua. She is an organizational psychologist, executive coach, and she's an ex-consultant in the big force. So Vero, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Monica. Lovely to, lovely to chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you. So the big topic for today is imposter syndrome and burnout because it's so relevant for all of us right now and uh Vero, like you did your phd on imposter syndrome so we're going to talk about imposter syndrome i mean you are the expert <laughs> right okay. so let me um So yeah, my, my doctorate is on self-doubt and self-criticism. And when you say it like that, it sounds so sad. Like, what's your PhD about self-doubt? So, um, so there is a pattern that I noticed over time. And perhaps this is a moment where I need to clarify. Uh, so a lot of people talk about imposter syndrome. And I decided to study uh, what's behind the imposter syndrome. And arguably, um, it's self doubt and self criticism and imposter syndrome is kind of the one of the symptoms of one of the uh, the signs that, that we are very self critical okay. um, and the definition of imposter syndrome is the inability to internalize successful experiences or accomplishments oh wow um, so so that's it's just one branch of Uh, not feeling good enough or uh, self doubt or self criticism, and the main the main reason why I decided to study that topic was because over the over time when I was working um, in uh, higher education and with senior leaders in different professional services firms, I noticed just one pattern, and that was self doubt and self criticism, and this was so so recurrent, so dominant that, uh, that I thought, well, this this is worth studying. The idea of studying a PhD while working full-time uh, in a demanding job, that was not a good idea. I would recommend it to <laughs> but, but here we are, yeah. But it's, it's a very, as you say, it's a very relevant topic and, and many yes. times connected with burning out, yeah. Yes, and then just let me expand on that. So basically you work with many consulting firms, the professional firms, and you saw this pattern of self-doubt among your peers or among executives that you were working with as a client? Or who who was like the who were the people that you saw this self-doubt in? So that we make it like we normalize it, you know, like everybody has it. So particularly I saw them in the clients, in the leaders that I was with the, the client organizations. Uh, and the client leaders that I was working with, either in one-to-one -one coaching or in group uh, in group sessions, um, this is this is where in the intimacy perhaps of the coaching session or in the intimacy of a small group uh, workshop, uh, that is when I started to notice it. But I, I would say that right now it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> I think it's, uh, the imposter syndrome has become much more, uh, yeah, as you say, normalized and ma yeah. much more widely spoken, which is which is positive. It's, it's good to talk about it and 
uh, as soon as you talk about it, the, the anxiety in the rooms goes down. Like everyone, you know, we're all going through it. It's part of uh, being human. Some research argue that more than 70% 70, 70 of us at some point in our career or lives will have a, a sense of self-doubt or imposter syndrome. Ooh, yeah, we have it all the time. <laughs> like, yeah. I think, well, so I perhaps think that's the key uh, it's not going to go away that easily, but perhaps the key is kind of trying to manage it a bit better. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So before we go into managing it better, what are the consequences of not managing it? What are the consequences of imposter syndrome as such? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, what will happen if you leave it wild, right? No, <laughs> do not leave your in a critic wild. So, and, and I talk a lot about, as you as you will hear, I, I, I talk a lot about inner critic, that kind of entity within us that is um, attacking and monitoring us and demanding a lot from us. Um, so uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of consequences, but um, a few of the ones that I, I um, recognize the most is uh, that also came up in my research is um, a low sense of self-doubt sorry, a low sense of um, self-worth. So mm -hmm. there is high, high self-criticism and that results in low sense of self-worth or arguably um, um, an ambivalent, a kind of pendulum, uh, an ambivalent sense of self-worth. It's not that we're all constantly feeling uh, uh, not good enough. There are times, and what I argue along with other pieces of research is that um, that time of self that is particularly more prominent when we uh, are going through a transition, you know, getting a new job or uh, taking on a, a big new client or a big new project. Or sometimes I do a lot of maternity and paternity coaching and sometimes coming back from maternity leave um, mm -hmm. after that big change, uh, this is when self-doubt creeps in. Why, why, why do we have those self-doubts? I know well, it's that, human, but but I'm like, no, why? No, that's but it. why? That's it. No, I'm glad that you asked. No, we didn't even prepare for it, but it's just I think is is um, is a very important to to recognize the origins of self doubt. There is a big chunk of my research that talks about uh, where they come from and the reason why why do we care? Why do we care? Whether <laughs> yeah, um, because um. The origins of self-doubt, of our own self-doubt, impact who we are today as adults. And, and so many, there's overwhelming amount of research that would suggest that self-doubts are, uh, are connected with our parental figures or the authority figures around us when we were growing up. The main caregivers, um, I don't know, the parents, grandparents, siblings, whoever, or teachers even, you know, yeah. and, and how we internalize those, those authority figures will partly, partly determine um, who, who we are as adults and how uh, critical or not we are with ourselves. And, and arguably, given that I'm doing a lot of work in leadership, those um, early authority figures and the internalization of the authority figures will impact our ability to take on a leadership role fully inhabit the role or not so that that's um so partly you know it's not so it's not it's not a direct connection but it influences you know yeah how you know the the inner voices uh, that we have within us uh, whether they are enabling voices voices or um disabling voices are, are are those voices that are so critical that are debilitating and holding us back or enabling voices that say you can do it uh, you will be good at that and, and so on yes that's a very good point because let's say in the pop culture in personal development culture there is a lot of narrative around changing your mindset and doing mantras and positive thinking that can be also toxic positive thinking um from your experience as an organizational psychologist, how can we change? Yeah, change the inner critic voices. Yeah, it, it's hard work. It's not going to happen that easily because those those inner voices have had been set up very early in life. Mm -hmm. But 
that but if we put the energy into it we can so uh, a lot of people we talk in psychology particularly more in clinical psychology i mean i've been working in business psychology for more than a decade but my earlier career has been in clinical psychology and we talk a lot about changing the narrative or exploring the past and exploring the past dissolves somehow helps to dissolve the, the impact that is happening today in the future so understanding what are those vo voices are saying uh, why are we still listening to them and how can we change that script that narrative we tell ourselves stories right and yeah and those stories many times comes from the past so so how can we rewrite those scripts? Um, and that's, that's that's not easy. That's not easy. It's not an easy activity, but uh, but it's not impossible. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it we can be done. Work. We could work on it. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And then I don't know how direct or indirect is the correlation, but there is some correlation between imposter syndrome and burnout. Definitely, yeah. I'm sure there is. I so. I would say that, um, so the equation that I see, uh, um, and it is a mixture of my research, other people's research, and my practice as a coach is that, so we start with self-criticism, that we go into a low sense of self-worth or an ambivalent sense of self-worth. What we do, what we do to compensate say we work harder so you feel not good enough you work harder you work more hours longer hours you take, to take you, you're not able to say no you take more and more and more um and perhaps you're you're taking even uh, prestigious jobs that where you're going to gain uh we are a sense of self-worth but that leads us many times to um to burn out or you know to negative stress yeah so self-criticism low sense of self-worth uh, working harder to compensate and then uh, burning out or negative stress. So how do we like how do we deal with all these better? Which strategies can we uh, use? So, so the, the good news, good news here, the good news is that there are different strategies to to work around this. Um, so the the two ones that are the the, the most important are. Um, self-awareness and self-compassion. Mm -hmm. So the self-awareness that you probably think, well, everyone knows about that, but is is half the battle, being able to actually recognize um, your own self-doubt, when, when those self-doubts and self-criticism is triggered, in what situation is uh, are those uh, self-doubts triggered? Um, and then what's up, and, and then as I mentioned earlier, explore the past, look back, um, do like a kind of personal audit on your own past and, and those voices and trying to to recognize what are those voices uh, saying and when they are not helpful. So, so uh, self-awareness um, give us the choice. Do we want to continue uh, thinking and behaving in the same way or do we want to take a different path, purposely a different path? Interesting. So that's why it's so important to have the battle. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the other strategy that I mentioned was uh, self compassion. And there is like two decades of research on self compassion. Uh, one of the key names are uh, Dr. Christine Neff in the US and Dr. Paul Gilbert here in the UK. Um, and they are free resources, you know. But so, uh, to you know, if people wants to Google them and and that, you know take the resources, uh, uh, so self compassion in this context means being able to to be kind and understanding towards yourself, mm. to be able to say to yourself, you know, okay. Um, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> it's okay, yeah. and uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Just and you know, if you think about self criticism as a a part of us, a child within us that is in distress. What would you do with a child in distress? You just comfort, you comfort him. them. He, you okay. say you try to listen to them, say what's what's going on, and you comfort them. So it's it's very much much connected with this part of you know this inner child that is feeling really overwhelmed, and and so so go and have a good dialogue. Um, and give yeah. give that child a bit of love. 
Yes, but that's a very that's a very good point because like at the end of the day, we all still have that inner child inside, right? So it's important to be like, hey, no, it's okay, it's okay. You're like, okay. <laughs> so it is important that we manage ourselves because otherwise yeah. no one will, right? Like your boss is not going to come and say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> That's yeah. not where we although, live. You know, <laughs> although uh, uh, leaders should be a bit more, yeah. Compassion. Um, Compassion and empathetic and being able to emotionally con contain stuff. Yes, yes, like, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's a bit of both. Like we, we should develop our own self-containment. Yes. Oh, that's a great point. Like as a manager, how can I help people to be more self-compassionate? Or how can I be that figure without being soft? You know, like... What are what what are your thoughts around that? Um, you know, I get I get contacted sometimes by um, yeah bosses or managers who said my or you know partners or, or leaders who say oh I have a member of my staff who is very self critical how can I be <laughs> um, and I I think the leaders can be can role model the idea of compassion and uh, accepting mistakes as part of any process mm. so that kind of suddenly lowers the anxiety right just like instead of uh having the pressure the like an unbearable pressure of uh, um you know the perfectionism uh, you know this is a lot to do with also perfectionism and my adaptive perfectionism but um you know how, how leaders can role model being compassion showing self-compassion um and uh, and recognizing that imperfection is part of life is part of any work process mm -hmm. and that that's key in, in within self uh, compassion in researching self compassion that idea of life is imperfect we are imperfect we need to accept this is is key in yeah that's a very good concept because <laughs> because exactly it's that's what it is like we just are it's not that we're perfect or imperfect we just are but then the inner voice it's like oh no it shouldn't be like that it should be like the other and that's where the conflict starts yeah partly yeah yes interesting how how do boundaries come in place in managing mm. all these situations mm, yeah <laughs> uh, Look, there are a lot of articles around boundaries, particularly um, since the pandemic, the how to set up boundaries and so on. Um, the, the boundaries connected to with my research, they have to do with the internal boundaries and being able to almost give yourself permission to set boundaries between you and work and how much you give away to work, you know. Um, how much you potentially lose yourself in uh, the work demands. I think um, so those are much more subtle boundaries that and again looking inwards and, and looking at so am I allowing myself to say actually this I have a lot in my plate I can't take anymore and being able to have that conversation with your boss. Yeah. Um, I think it is it, 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 it allowing yourself that. Yeah. And for example, in your case, like you moved away from traditional work and now you are your own boss, right? <laughs> you have your own practice. So how does that apply? How do applying boundaries applies if you are a freelancer or business owner? You don't have a boss. Oh gosh. It, there are there are almost no boundaries. <laughs> like <it's> just, <laughs> it all gets like <laughs> Um, and I'm I'm figuring that myself at the moment, but the the difference here is that when you work for yourself, it doesn't feel alienating. When you work for another firm or a, but a, for a big organization, um, the the boundaries are obviously necessary because otherwise it's almost. If you just respond to the organization's demands, it's, it's alienating. You, many times you lose your own self there. But mm -hmm. because, uh, um, you know, as I'm working for myself, it's, it's actually it's a slightly different that, yeah, there is, there is 
almost no boundary between home and, and work that is so enjoyable that it's it's okay right it's okay lots of the projects that i'm doing are so exciting and uh the work the people that i'm working with it's uh it's very exciting people to work with so so you painted like you painted very nicely it's kind of like freelancing a lot of the pressure of working in a big organization it's kind of gone that's how i heard i'm like oh that sounds beautiful but i you have pressure of, of getting money <laughs> like rather than a salary yeah but the sense of freedom uh, has no price okay um no but i tell you i tell you the downside is um it's just it's a bit lonely working for it for yourself it's a, it's a bit lonely although i mean i have a good ne network of colleagues and friends and so on but it's you know it's a bit lonely and also one of the things that i miss the most is the hr and uh, uh, it support the it oh, yes. help desk you know when you call and you just say i have a problem the problem is the problem and no i know you know the, just so trying to speak to google because your Gmail doesn't <laughs> bless them. They're lovely, but it's just like yeah. So I miss I miss the the IT support and and the people around. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Cool. Well, Vero, it's been an amazing conversation. Very thoughtful. Very. I what I like it's like that it's based on research. You know, it's not just let's talk about imposter syndrome. What I believe and think. It's more of a coming from a PhD, <laughs> like a doctorate on the topic. So it's been absolutely amazing. What would be your final remarks for anyone that's constantly having imposter syndrome as a summary? Mm. So as I said earlier, uh, self-doubt and self-criticism criticism will be there. There's, this is going to be it's part of being human. Um, just catch it at the right time before it, is, it becomes too much of a monster. Just catch it at catch the right it. time. Speak to other people. Um, practice that compassion. How do you catch it at the right time? Uh, you you consciously label label your thoughts and feelings, saying, "Just I'm I'm notice I'm notice I'm feeling anxious. I'm notice I'm being critical." And sometimes you usually have an anchor, somebody who is an anchor to you, a good friend, your partner, <laughs> your brother, your sister, whoever is around you. And do a sense check. Am I being too critical now? Or am I being too dot, 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 dot? Yeah, I think uh, having somebody who helps us as an anchor. Yes, that's, that's a great idea. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Vero. It's been an absolute pleasure having you in the show. If anyone wants to reach out to you and like find more about your work or reach out as a executive coach or the organization as such, where can they find you? Well, um, just I'm I'm quite active in LinkedIn, so they can they can send me a LinkedIn invite and we can start the conversation there. Amazing, and obviously all your details will go into the podcast notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. No, thank you, Vero. It's been a pleasure. Ciao, ciao.